Good evening, uh, everybody. Um, my name is Peter van Bollen. I'm, uh, I'm here speaking as director of the Tarkovsky Institute to introduce uh, Professor Lynn Foxholm. Very, very pleased uh, to introduce uh, Lynn here to speak. Uh, Lynn uh, comes to us from, uh, in general, from the University of Liverpool, where she currently has uh, the division of histories, languages, and culture, so in a way, all the things that matter in a university. <laughs> <laughs> um, before that, she was uh, educated at Bryn Mawr University and began her uh, doctoral work at uh, Penn University. But then halfway, she transferred her studies and her life to the UK, uh, where she eventually uh, graduated at Liverpool. And from Liverpool, she moved on for nearly two decades. She taught at the University of Leicester as a professor of, uh, at the School of Asian History and uh, Archaeology uh, until the end of last year, really, when she or last year when she transferred to uh, the University of Liverpool. That on the formal side, in terms of content, uh, Lynn is one of those few persons who are versed in ancient history, and so you will see from the talk uh, she was earlier just saying the most. The Boston is, I think. 57, yes. It's got to come up. Um, <laughs> we get but a physical de demonstration of the Boston. Precisely. So the sources, the, the ancient authors are coming up. The archaeology uh, is there as well. But on top of that, uh, Lynn also has a strong back background in anthropology. So really one of those people who sort of covered all uh, those fields. And these three fields, she has been uh, roaming to, uh, well, basically to feed her interests that are encompass gender, the ancient economy sort of more generally, but also more specifically with the rural world and all these elements coming together. She has uh, directed uh, in the past, what was it, six, seven years, a large Lieberholm funded project based at Leicester uh, on craft, ancient craft productions um, and has been conducting fieldwork in Greece, but also for the last decade or so, yeah. fieldwork in Calabria. It was still sort of ancient, uh, greater Greece in a way, but not in Italy, of course. Uh, and it's on all those aspects, Calabria, uh, gender, economy, rural world, all of these aspects uh, she'll be touching on in this particular talk. And um, the title of which is Webs of Knowledge. Yes, um, I'm sorry, it's slightly changed, but it doesn't, it's the same talk. <laughs> well, <laughs> Webs of Knowledge is a very intriguing title, so uh, Lynn, uh, I'll leave it there to you to. Uh, Great. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for your very kind introduction. Can everybody hear all right? The microphone is working good. And um, thank you, as, uh, for, I'm very grateful for the, for the, to the Joukowsky for having me and letting me give a paper here at what is clearly an incredibly busy time for you, even by the standards of your incredibly vibrant and active institution. It's just such a fantastic place to be. And I'm also grateful, as Peter said, to the Leverhulm Trust, who's funded a lot of the research that underpins the paper I'm giving tonight. Now, textile manufacture, that it was women's work in the ancient Greek world, is, is widely accepted. Um, sorry, I'm just making sure I don't burble on too long. Um, that textile work was women's, that textile manufacture was women's work in the ancient Greek world is widely accepted. And Though this, along with the character of textile production itself, has recently been questioned in classical Athens, and that's where I'll kind of start the paper tonight um, with that questioning. Um, but the hard evidence that survives for an art that is, for the most part, very ephemeral, ephemeral it's all on perishable materials, um, is much trickier to interpret than has often been recognized. And scholars of the ancient economy have often um, collapsed many different aspects of tex textile manufacture, different techniques, different processes, all put them into the same lump. And I want to kind of unpick that a little bit in this talk. That's one of the things that I, I want to look at. Of course, it's also often been relegated to a back corner of ancient economies as something that isn't very important because it's just women's work. And one of the aims of this paper tonight is really to look at the way in which making textiles 
is a much more complicated process than one might think at first glance. And I want to look at the context of making and distributing textiles and the context in which this is done to consider a much more complex and nuanced picture of that activity so central to women's work. So I want to start with a recent book. And can I say at the outset, I've just talked to Catherine about it this afternoon, and we agree, it's a terrible book. <laughs> um, so I'll just be right up front about that from the start. I want to start with this very recent book by Peter Acton, um, Poiesis, Manufacturing in Classical Athens. Now, Acton's mission is to highlight the importance of manufacturing in the economy of classical Athens. And that's actually something that's a really interesting thing to do and very welcome. Um, but he's writing from a perspective of modern business strategy based on his own experience with a consultancy firm. And he attempts to show how the principles of competitive advantage in tandem with potential for differentiation and barriers to entry, structured Athenian manufacturing. Now, in my personal view, there are a huge number of problems with his methodologies anyway, and certainly with the data that he's drawing on. And on textiles, I think this comes out very, very clearly indeed. Um, so Acton suggests that, that households could not have produced all the clothing and textiles that they needed. And he argues, therefore, that textile manufacture was carried out not only in domestic settings, but also in numerous large commercial workshops, regularly involving large numbers of male weavers, as well as women, and supplying a lively retail market. And he presents textile making as, an, as, a, as a craft that needs minimal skill so that anybody could enter the trade with little training or capital. So it's, it's, he sees it as very rock-bottom unskilled labor. Now, I think this picture is both distorted and unrealistic. And one of the problems is that he's really fundamentally misunderstood a lot of the primary source material and the archaeological data. And because of that, he hasn't really got a very good grip on the basic learning and skills and processes in their social context and this very complexity that I want to explore. So in a way, we're starting with the negative. So I want to start with what is actually a very good question to ask, and that is, we always think textile making women's work. Well, was it really women's work? Maybe we should look at that again. Now, this was a question that was raised back in 1982 by Wesley Thompson. And on your handout, sorry about the capacious handout, but I thought it would just be easier if we had the texts as well. There's handouts out the door if anybody doesn't have one. Um, on the back, I've actually put the references of things that I'm referring to. So back in 1982, Wesley Thompson argued for the presence in Athens and in the Athenian economy of numerous male weavers, largely on the evidence of Plato and Aristotle. And Acton picks up this and says, we know of lots of male weavers, and goes on to assume that commercial weavers are largely male. So I thought, that's weird. And I went back, and I looked at all those passages. And it turns out to be actually really interesting, more interesting than I thought it would be, um, because and I've just given one example here, but there are many more that one could cite. So the first passage on your handout from the Republic, it turns out that where, where Plato apparently refers to male weavers, and this passage from the Republic is one of them, um, in fact, it's these very abstracted passages where craft specialization is being used as a metaphor to explain other, princi other principles and, to, and to, to, it's used on a kind of very high, up in the sky kind of level. So it's used to explain things like, in this passage, the minimum necessary skills to support the ideal city or how the naming of things relates to their functions and affordances or to different kinds of relationships. So in this particular passage, 
you can see that, that Plato is going back to first principles on what do you actually need for existence? Well, you need food, you need housing, you need clothing, and so you need producers of these things. And so they're just being kind of, in the abstract, generalized as male <laughs> gender. He's not talking about really real weavers. He's talking about them in this abstract way. And the other passages that I've looked at, they do the same thing, which is, is kind of cool. Because that contrasts really, really radically where with the passage, the next passage um, of Plato, where he actually gets to talking about the actual skills and capacities of men and women, where he observes that men, of course, are better at everything than women are, except for weaving and cooking. And of course, they don't matter so much, really, because they're just women's work. But there, the weavers, or the, it's very clear that the people doing the weaving are women, because it's an explicitly gendered and gendered work discussion. So even within Plato, it's very inconsistent. So he's not talking about real weavers doing real jobs. He's talking about, in that first passage, suppliers of things in this kind of abstract way. So I think one has to look very, very carefully at that kind of evidence that Acton and Thompson cited for so-called male weavers they're in philosophical discussions. They're not talking about, in those passages, anything to do with real life. We are, after all, here dealing with, with literary slash philosophical texts. Now, where we do have weaving establishments described as headed by a man, for example, in, Xenophon, in the Xenophon passage, that's the next one on the handout, um, it's made clear that the work is being done by slaves whose gender we don't know. And to what extent the male manager, there is a male manager here, engaged in the actual work isn't actually clear. But this passage is interesting for other reasons, and I'll come back to it at the end. Um, but where we, there, in other instances, like the Iskines passage next on the handout, where there is indeed a male textile worker, this is a passage where we have a male textile worker who is, in fact, a slave. And where we have male textile workers, they almost all do seem to be slaves and or foreigners, which is quite interesting. So there are, in fact, many reasons to think that women were the dominant producers of textiles. And there's a lot more supporting, um, and there's a lot more supporting evidence for women as weavers than for male weavers or male-dominated workshops. Where you have male weavers, they are exceptional, which is interesting. So it's not to say that they're not there at all, but they're certainly, that's not where it's really happening for textile manufacture. And I hope you'll believe me by the end of the paper. Um, and certainly, symbolically and socially and conceptually, textiles are very, very clearly associated with women, not with men. So for example, the many dedications of clothing that you get in the Temple of Artemis at Brauron, where it's recorded on inscriptions, some bits of which are in Brauron, but there are copies also on the Acropolis. All the clothing dedications, the dedications are all being made by women, even when it's ma male clothing that's being dedicated. And Brauron is also full of, of um, weaving equipment and loom weights and other things, <coughs> other weaving tools. These show up in many other sanctuaries as well. And I'm pretty sure they're not male dedications. It would be very surprising if they were. So, so I think there is a lot of good evidence for that conceptual, as it were, um, ideological association of women and weaving. And indeed, one could easily think of textiles as being stored female labor. Um, so that the most obvious way for woman, women to produce wealth from their own labor is via textile manufacture since, and this is another paper, virtually all other forms of crafts, craftsmanship and crafts working seem to have excluded women at least insofar as they're identified. Now, it's not to say they never worked in crafts, 
but they're not running the show in a lot of craft production, which is quite interesting. And, and that's another quite complicated argument that I won't go into now. But for example, the Gortin Code is a really interesting example where a divorcing woman not only takes her dowry with her if she divorces, but half of what she has made within, i.e. the textiles. So that's another interesting one. So this, if you have lots of female labor in a household, making textiles is actually a good thing to do with it. It's a good way of using that female labor. And I do think these women are doing exactly that. Um, now, names and, and occupational names are quite interesting and also quite problematic because they're either identify, identifications put on somebody by another person or they're self-identifications in some kind of relatively public sense, which means that you would, you would explain what you would describe yourself to others using a term that is kind of publicly acceptable, but you might self-identify in other ways as well. So I don't think you can read these terms anything like at face value. But um, Ed Harris, in his 2002 study of occupational designations, again, reference on the back, um, assembled a whole load of um, these occupational names. And, but he didn't actually look at them by gender. And one of the interesting things is that although you have 173 application, uh, occupations appearing in masculine forms as men's jobs, only 27 have feminine forms or are clearly in contexts where they're being done by women. Um, and of those 27, nine have corresponding male forms, but the other 18 don't. Now, at least insofar as you're looking at the description of occupations, in other words, what's in people's heads, as opposed to what people really do, which might be slightly different, there is a really clear separation in occupational names between women and men. That you, uh, you, you have that little overlap is quite striking. And, um, and of the 18 solely female occupations that you have, um, the largest and most common category are various kinds of textile working, which is clearly a skill that all women were expected to acquire. And as I said, practically the only craft regularly open to women. And it's a really interesting difference from the Roman world because you do have met much more in the way of male weavers in the Roman world or men involved in textile manufacture. In, in the Greek world, it's really, if they're there, honestly, they're almost invisible. They're the exceptions. They're very hard to see. So I know this evidence is problematic, but it's still really interesting. And this is just really to show some of the kinds of things that you get with these these, these fialae, which may or may not have something to do with manumission, these are very problematic um, and have been interpreted in a bunch of ways. But from my point of view, whatever they are, things like the, um, these terms like um, talais yorgos, okay, there. And you, again, you get a whole bunch of these women identifying as wool spinners, spinster, it's almost like that English term, old-fashioned English term spinster, textile workers of some sort. Now these are very problematic because it's very much debated whether this is a kind of cover for people who are in the sex trade. It could be. I I'm, I'm, I'm feel very torn about this one. It certainly could be because women never do self-identify in these documents as being in the, self, in the sex trade. And many of the women in this were clearly, these women are clearly slaves, originally at least. And, and it's not surprising they don't self-identify in a public document by saying, I'm a prostitute. Well, surprise. On the other hand, they may be exactly what they say they are, and that is people who work wool. We just can't be absolutely sure, and it's extremely problematic. But the fact that there are so many of them identifying that way, and of course textile workers and prostitutes 
need not be mutually exclusive categories. That's also, of course, been argued. But it's a very good it's a very good reason for thinking that these things are very that these things are very complicated. Um, so it is interesting to see, but it only kind of gets you so far. Now I want to turn to the process of learning to weave, because I think this is one of the areas where Acton goes horribly wrong. It's, it's a much longer and much more socially embedded process than Acton or most other people suppose. This is not a skill that any old person could pick up in two hours. It's something that really took many, many years to learn, and it was done through a very complicated, socially embedded kind of process. Now, for a start, um, it's very, very clear that, that learning to weave, that weaving, full stop, was a group activity. And I use this vase, but it's, it's obvious from other things as well. And one of the reasons, there are many reasons why I think weaving was a group activity, and I think there are many reasons why it was a group activity. But for one thing, it's the sheer practicality of actually trying to weave with a warp-weighted loom. And there are some really useful ethnographic examples that help us on this one, one of which I think I have actually put on your handout. Yes, I have. Um, now, one of the things that's actually useful that Plato says, which is just after the Gortin Code, is that is, is a really interesting little sideline on how people learn crafts, including weaving. And surprise, surprise, an awful lot of craft traditions appear to be learned within the household, within the family. And this fits in very, very interestingly with lots of ethnographic accounts of how people learn crafts, learn how to do things, including learning how to weave. And there are two very nice recent studies, um, again, both on the back of your handout, one by Anna Portish and one by um, Miriam Naji, on learning to read, weave in, in ethnographic societies where people are still weaving in domestic settings. And it's very clear from these studies that this takes, being a becoming a skilled textile worker takes many, many years of practice and apprenticeship. Now, Anna Portish, the, from whom I've quoted a little bit right there, because I just think it's such a nice, dis dis nice description, um, studied textile production among Kazakh women in Western Mongolia. Here, textiles are made at home for domestic use and are particularly important components of the wealth exchanged on marriage. And girls started learning to make textiles as children gradually, informally helping out their mothers and other female relatives, children running around with the sheep, picking burrs out of fleeces and things like that. And although men occasionally help out with specific tasks, the overall responsibility is in the hands of women. So little children, they imitate what parents are doing, they look after sheep, but it's not until they're large and strong enough at the age of about 12 or 13 that girls begin to help with the actual preparation of wool for felt and weaving. And this task is done as a group with each individual adjusting their movements and their rhythm to synchronize with each other, sometimes to the accompaniment of songs and speech. And so by 14 or 15, girls are helping out with spinning. They're fluffing out wool for making it, wool for making it ready for, for spinning into thread. They wind the spun wool, then they practice spinning on their own, and then they start to learn sewing and quilting. But even when they marry, they're continuing to work under the direction of a mother-in-law. Now, among the Berber carpet weaving families of the Sirwa Mountains in, in Morocco, Maryam Naji found um, that the loom was a semi-permanent fixture in houses. Babies and toddlers play around it when they're very small, but boys gradually distance themselves from it. 
And little girls, however, imitating their mothers, they learn the right ways to sit and stand and hold their body. So these children in these societies, they are literally embodying the movements by looking and watching and being part of the society of how you do it as you grow up. I mean, little kids imitate. That's, that's their job. And, and this is what they do. And so by the time they're grown up, they have all of the correct positions and movements, and they can blend in with the movements and gestures of other weavers to work in a group. And I would argue that, again, artistic license allowing, and there's much artistic license in the representation of weaving on vases that, that you can't read it literally. But this weaving in a group and doing these things in a group, that I think is, is not artistic license. And one of the things about warp-weighted looms is that you have to be big and strong, <laughs> actually, to use a warp-weighted loom. Six-year-olds cannot do this. They are not physically large or strong enough. And if you look at those nice Norwegian ladies up there, you can see they're standing on a bench to be able to beat upward, which takes a serious amount of physical strength and effort. And I think this, Whereas, say, in, in when you see them in, in pots, these younger women, they're doing things like they're, they're, this, is, this is fluffing out the wool and making it into rows to make it wedding for, ready for spinning. You see girls holding a distaff, ready, ready to spin. You see women in a bridal scene holding distaffs. They're not weaving. They're spinning. They're doing other jobs. And I don't think that's accidental, and I don't think that's artistic license. This is something that Gloria Ferrari pointed out a long time ago. I think a lot of the stuff she says is mad, especially the bit about it representing Bronze Age megarons. You can just eliminate that. But she's absolutely right that when you have these young girls being shown off in, in visual imagery, it is spinning that they're doing, not weaving. And I think there is a very good reason for that as we move on. Because girls, I think, actually learn to weave at a relatively late age because of the whole issue of, of physical strength. And they're doing this not just on their own with their mother, but in a whole group of women, probably a lot female relatives, slaves, other people hanging on in the house, who knows? But these households, I think they have weaving groups of women in there. And it makes us completely reread and rethink Isomachus's wife, who arrived, ideally, knowing only how to receive wool and produce a cloak, having seen how the textile making tasks are given to the slaves. You can't actually weave on these looms at age 10. So if you think about it, what this must mean is that a girl begins her textile training in her natal home with her mother, sisters, aunts, female relatives, and so forth. This must have continued in the company of her mother-in-law and the female relatives of her husband once she was married. So as she moves houses, she's both bringing in new ideas about how to do stuff, which may not be listened to when she's 15, but by the time she becomes a mean grandmother, she'll say, well, my mom did it this way. And at the same time, she's also learning new stuff from a new group of women. So I think we're in a really interesting position to see how ideas about how to make textiles are moving from one household to another as women move as well. And I think when we come to look at the textile tools, we can actually see that in the material record as well. And I'll get to that in a minute, because that's also a really interesting aspect of it. So you can see that Isomachus's wife would have known a little bit of stuff but she wouldn't have been a fully trained up weaver by the time she comes into that house. And of course, it's, it's a philosophical treatise. It's very idealized. 
none of this stuff can you believe at face value, but I think this is genuine re genuinely reflecting what is actually a much more complicated and long drawn out training process where ideas and training and techniques are moving right across families. So keep that in mind when we start looking at some of this other stuff. Now, what is also interesting is that, hang on here, um, what is also interesting is that if weaving takes a group to do it, and I think it does, you have to be in a household that is rich enough to have a loom, that has fleeces, that has lots of women around, that you have some slaves, and da-da-da-da-da. What about those old ladies living on their own, those destitute old ladies? And Demosthenes is my, 57, is one of my favorite examples of a destitute old lady. Um, and I think I've put the passage there. But we'll look at that in a second. And it's very clear that you do get women who are not weaving on a loom because they're not in a situation where they can. So the, the speaker in Aristophanes' Frogs, who is spinning thread to sell in the market, but, and she's spinning specifically linen thread to spell, sell in the market, which is really interesting. Um, but she's not weaving it. She's not weaving it. And that, to me, that's a social signal. And I'll tell you how I know it's a social signal, I think, in a minute. Because if we look at Demosthenes 57, you can see that you have, and you run into this quite a lot. There are a lot of other references to it as well. These, these women that sell ribbons, OK? Now, they're not ribbons. The word is tinea, tinei. And they're not ribbons. They're woven bands. And they're much more likely to be decorative bands and they can buy, made by a very different technique, which I will show you in a minute, called tablet weaving, which are also sewn onto clothing. Now, the speaker in Demosthenes 57 is a really interesting case in point because she's somebody who, where the speaker explains, is trying to keep his own citizenship, so he's explaining why his mother worked as a wet nurse and why, why she was a seller of tiny eye in the marketplace and all the rest of it. And according to the speaker, her first husband dumped her to marry a wealthier Epicleros, and with a young daughter already, she was married off to somebody else and she had more children, and it sounds like husband number two might have been of lower status. And so she ended up basically, when her husband went off on military service, destitute, apparently had no other source of support. And so what she ends up doing is weaving tiny eye to support herself. Now, the cool thing about this is that tablet weaving is something that you can do as a sad old lady or a sad destitute mother on your own without having to do it in a whole group of women. And the interesting thing about it is that you're doing it not only, that this tablet weaving is not only the decorative bands that you so often see on vases, on clothing, as, as borders and things. It's the fillets that get tied on graves, it's the headbands, it's all these things. And it's also the loom warps. Now, tablet weaving, and this is tablet weaving, okay, looks like this. And all you need is some string and some cards. I've got some very nice, those, those are made in cards so you can actually see them. But anybody who wants can come up and see these afterward. I've got another one here where these cards are leather, okay? Really tiny little leather cards and you make nice little woven bands from them, okay? But the ones that turn up in Artemis Orsia that nobody recognized, are actually made in bone, okay? And the woven bands are used to start the loom weight, so you can see them, the, the loom warp. So you can see with the model textiles, that's the woven band. So it's, oops, it's this bit, okay, this kind of bit. But what you do when you're making it into a loom warp is you cut off every string every time you put the shuttle through and you just 
leave them hanging, okay? So then this bit would be your loom warp bit. So instead of continuing going back and forth, I would leave every single string hanging and cut it off, and then you end up with a loom warp, with this bit being at the top, and, whoops, sorry, and it's, and it's that, okay? So it's really interesting. And this is another model loom warp. It's really interesting. You can see they've knotted it to show that you, you knot the threads so that they don't get all tangled up and gross, I think is what's going on there. So you do get these like model cloths and model loom weights showing up. And with the, excuse me having my back to you for a minute, I will see if I can do this in a way that doesn't. So with this, the tricky bit is always tying it on. I think we'll just about manage it. Yep, there we go. And we'll have to get the get this off to start with and get the guy out. So what you basically do is you thread hang on, we'll do it. Do it this way. Okay. So what you basically do is you thread your Here we go. You thread your thread through the cards, okay, and you hold them tight at this end, and then you, sorry, I'm going to have a slight technical hitch here while I get that. You need something to tie it to, like yourself. Okay, that should do it. And then what I do is I flip the cards, keeping this taut. You, you, oops, it's just what you don't want to do. You flip the cards round. Okay, and that gives you a new shed. And then you flip your little bit through and pound it into place and that's how it works. It's a really cunning way of producing these, these I'm not very good at it, but it's a really cunning way of producing these nice bands. But if you're a little old lady on your own without very much money, without a group to support you and you can only afford to buy bits of thread, you could do this and you could sell it in the market in a way that obviously if you're trying to weave and produce a big, you know, to produce stuff on a big loom, you could not possibly do if you were a destitute woman. And I'm now inclined to think that when we get this, the, this, this designation of women in things like Attic Oratory, but it shows up in drama, it shows up in other things, of these women who are sellers or makers of tiny eye, for a Greek audience, that almost certainly was a kind of social signal that what you were dealing with was a destitute woman, that somebody who really, really had no family around her or working group to support her, and that she was really doing this because she was specifically destitute. So, it, you know, it's, it's again how much more complicated the social organization of this textile making actually is. They're, it's not all being done by the same people. And now I want to move on to the, some of the actual textile tools, more of the textile tools themselves that we actually have, and, and look at loom weights and looms. Now, loom weights are really interesting. They're much more interesting than you might think. Um, and people often traditionally have just thrown them into bags and ignored them, but they're much more fun than that. Now, Greek looms, most Greek looms, and I'll show you an interesting example of one, which is a Greek, which is a Greek loom in a non-Greek house, but that's another story. Um, Greek looms, a lot of them seem to be about two meters wide, um, and this is on a vase, but like real looms seem to be about two meters wide as well, and you can see you actually have about, fit, you need about 70 to 100 loom weights per loom, which is really interesting. And these loom weights are interesting because the two levels show the two different sheds. 
So that's quite a nice example that's actually reasonably accurate. But in fact, you never find enough loom weights in a house. And again, there are different ways of tying these loom weights on and all the rest of it, depending on what you're weaving and all sorts of things. It gets quite complicated. But you never find enough loom weights in a house, or almost never, um, to, to, to indicate that there's enough for a whole loom. And that's very interesting. And there are, there are a couple of things I've been thinking about that. Now, not all loom weights are marked, but about in most assemblages that I've looked at, and I've, other people I've talked to have said the same thing, about 25 to 30 percent of them are marked in some way. Many of them with stamps, little stamp seals that you get on rings, often from metal rings, because you can see the little metal bits in the stamp thing. Um, but they mark them in all sorts of other ways as well. So you get things like impressions of jewelry. That's, that's impressed with a fibula. That, those are impressed with earrings. You get them impressed with finger rings, necklaces. I have some impressed with astragaloi. I have some impressed with ears of grain. I have one with a smiley face, um, really, truly. Um, and you can see here, these, it's not a very good picture, but these are the kinds of earrings, <coughs> little knobby earrings, that were then squashed into that loom weight. Buttons, buttons are quite common. That's another one you get. All kinds of different very girly things. This is one of my personal favorites. I have several examples of these where you have a fibula with tweezers hanging from it. And of course, we have actual examples of these things that show up in graves. But this, somebody has used to squish into a loom weight. Now, this raises really interesting questions, for one thing, about the manufacture of these loom weights. Because these seals are women's personal seals. There are instances where we definitely have manufacturer's seals or stamps. And they're different, and you can tell, and you get multiples of them. So I was talking with William Alward last week in, <coughs> in um, Wisconsin at Madison, where at Troy in the classical period, he has, up in the, t in the sanctuary, he has a series of, lo of stamped loom weights where you have, over a period of time, about maybe seven or eight different stamp seals on them. And I'm guessing there that they're a stamp, they're a, they're a, they're a, a, a ring that belongs to a priestess. Because in the Temple of Athena at Troy, that would kind of make sense. And that they're being stamped with her ring, and that every time the priestess changes, the ring changes. So, and there are also examples I have of places where you have workshops, and they're clearly making specific loom weights for specific purposes or sets. And they do mark them with maker's marks. But that's unusual. Most of these marks that you get on loom weights, and many of them are not stamps, are women's personal marks. And the clay mixes that you get in loom weights are weird. So in terms of ceramics, you often get a very clear range of different ceramic types for different functions on classical sites or in classical areas. So you have like fine wear fabrics and cooking wear fabrics and plain wear fabrics and, and amphora fabrics and tile fabrics. And loom weights often seem to be clay mixes, which is really interesting. So it looks like somebody is going along at the end of the day and you know, getting, getting a bunch of, of, I don't know, clay from Uncle Cleon or whatever and making it into loom weights. And some loom weights are really, really look pretty homemade. Now, these are not the worst. I have some even worse ones from Artemis Orthea in Sparta, which look as if they were made and squished together and literally thrown in the kitchen fire. And one of the interesting idea, one of the ideas I've been toying with, and I don't know how I would get evidence of this, but one of the things I've been toying with is that some loom weights may not have been fired at all. That in prehistoric sites, particularly Neolithic sites, you get loom weights surviving that got accidentally caught in house fires, but we can see that they were not fired to start with. And if women were making loom weights out of clay that were not fired, we would not have them. So 
there's all sorts of weird things going on. These are again from Metaponto, and they're being they're being marked with literally fingerprints. So these are identifiable, and and they go with women. Now the even more interesting thing is the way in which again this is just the survey data, but you can see these are these are farmhouse sites, and looking at the farmhouse sites, very few of these sites even the excavated sites, do you find more than a few loom weights? So when women leave houses, they're taking their loom weights with them, which is kind of no surprise, but it's really interesting. Most of the time they are. When you get really a lot of loom weights in one place, there's something else weird going on. And I think it's a very good indication that loom weights were valued, but not valuable. And they are very, very, they're clearly close <coughs> to women's hearts. So for example, where I do have in my Metaponto assemblage, and I, and I can parallel this in Athens and in Corinth and in other places, you get, like, I've got two loom weights here, okay? They have actually identical stamps on them, but what's really interesting is where they're found. One of them here, and one of them up here. Now that says to me what we've got is two related women in two different households. Okay, that's really cool. Or here's another example. I have three identical loom weights with these little rosette stamps on them, and that may be, that may be actually a, 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 a heritage stamp, because sometimes you get stamps that are way older than the loom weights are, suggesting that the ring is moving down the family from mother to daughter and then showing up in the house. So with these, I've got three of them, um, one lot is here in this site, and about 50 years later, now watch the position of that, it moves down the road, okay, to a different site. Again, and this is, these are just two examples, I have other examples of this as well. This, I think, is loom weights that are being handed down families. So when girls get married or something, or who knows what, the, some of these weaving tools, when they move to their new house, like we were looking at with Xenophon's wife, these things are going with these girls, and they're keeping them and they're taking them with them. We don't find very many of them, because when they abandon houses, they mostly take most of the loom weights with them, but occasionally we get them. <coughs> and I've got a humdinger of an example of a heritage loom weight. Now, this is an excavated site, <coughs> Fattoria Fabrizio. It's published. It's on the back of your handout. And with this one, because it was well excavated, I know exactly where that loom weight was found. And it was in an assemblage of fourth century pottery and domestic junk, which clearly crashed off a shelf. And it's a sixth century loom weight in a fourth century use context. It's not residual. It was still in use when the house was being built. And, even, and we know it's sixth century, not from the shape of the loom weight, which is not determinate, although in the Metaponto assemblage, as it happens, pyramidal loom weights <coughs> tend to be earlier than circular ones, but that's another story. But because of that iota, okay, that, that or sorry, yes, it is, that curvy iota, which they didn't even do beyond the, late, the early fifth century. They didn't even use that letter form. Not only that, this is a loom weight where um, the writing isn't Metaponto writing. It comes from further south somewhere, maybe Region or something like that. So this is a loom weight with a graffito on it by presumably a woman who is from a different part of Italy and who is somehow in this house and it's got handed down. So we get heritage stamps, we get heritage loom weights, we get loom weights moving around. And they show up in a whole bunch of different assemblages across the Greek world. As I say, this is just one example. But these things are clearly moving around much more than you would think. And women are directly involved in their manufacture, their, mar their marking, as well as their use for making textiles. Now, this is just to give you an example. And you might have heard about this last week from your visitor, Massimo Osana, my lovely friend, who has given me, given me and my, my research assistant, Alessandro Quercia, to publish this material and to use this material. This is the site of Torre di Satriano, right up near Potenza in the mountains in the middle of Italy. 
And it's a really interesting site. Now, I know Massimo thinks this is two separate families. There was one that lived up here. There's a house in the sort of 8th, 7th century up here on the hill. And then in the early 6th century, they build this palazzo down below, at which point they're really closely in contact with Greeks because you've probably, many of you, seen this already. They have this lovely Greek frieze around it where they appear to have brought lo Laconian workmen up from Taranto to make this frieze locally. And you can tell it's Laconian workmen because they have the IKEA self-assembly instructions on the back of the terracotta plaques. Now, this is a really interesting kind of engagement because Greeks would have thought it was really tacky to put a frieze on your house like that. It's what you would find on a public building. But these guys wanted a frieze. Now, they also pick up another interesting idea from the Greeks. And they're very selective about this. And they're very deliberate about choosing to do this. And that is that in the earlier house, you have these big, clunky Iron Age loom weights. You could make relatively fine textiles with them with a lot of effort. But they're really for kind of big blanket things. In the 6th century, they start to produce textiles on really a quite industrial scale. <coughs> there must have been at least 30 women in this house working on textiles almost full time. There were three looms here, all in an area of, surprise, two meters, um, width of the loom. There were three warped looms leaning up against the wall, 285 loom weights from here and another 108 over here where they fell off a shelf with a bunch of domestic pottery. That's the loom weights, OK? Honest to God, there's gazillions of them. And they're also, that's just the same ones laid out. And if you see, they're, they're, they were made all in one big batch, practically. They're all virtually identical. There are a few of them with ring marks on them from jewelry, but not many. And this is the other batch here um, in amongst the pottery. And when you look at them, it's really interesting. This is in the, in the, the ones on the shelf are this cluster. The other three carefully fall into three weight groups. Isn't that cool? So you can see it really was three looms. And they'd very carefully selected the weights of the loom weights so that they matched really closely. Now, you also find that when you look at a site like Olynthus, you get the same thing. So in most houses, you only find a couple of loom weights. Where you find a lot of loom weights is very unusual. And the, the Olynthus loom weights, again, are similarly about 25% of them marked, stamped in this way. Now, this is really interesting. This is Nick Cahill's list of all what he thinks of as weaving rooms, but they're not. Um, of caches of loom weights. None of them has enough loom weights in it for a whole loom, except this one weird house where there's 247 of them. Now, in the Torre de Satriano example, I think one of the things that's most interesting about this is that what you must be looking at is a huge number of women here doing Greek-style weaving, making genuine Greek textiles, but they must have brought Greek women up there to train, if maybe train their own women. Maybe they have a bevy of Greek women. I slightly wonder if they don't actually have a bevy of Greek slaves that they've bought and have taken up there. So however it's being organized, whoever these women are, they're certainly being trained by expert Greek woman weavers. And presumably, they're selling their wonderful textiles from their wonderful upland sheep down in Taranto as genuine Greek textiles. But the interesting thing is that in this case, even when they abandon the house, probably damaged in an earthquake, all of the textile, all of the loom weights are still there, suggesting that they don't belong to those women. And in the Olynthus example, you have exactly the same thing, that all of the te all that one house with 247 loom weights suggests to me that something else is going on there. And that the, this is a workshop where you have women who, for one reason, or weavers who, for one reason or another, do not own those loom weights. So when they abandon the house, the women don't take them. 
So something else is happening there, and it's different. It's anomalous. But you so rarely find loom weights in a pattern like that. So it's, it's, it's quite a different kind of, of, of issue here. And it has a real effect on what we think is going on in these houses and how these, these groups of weavers in houses are working. So I won't say very much about Building Z. It's a very problematic building, and it brings us back to whether we have women who are textile workers or prostitutes or both. It's been identified in one of its phases as a... It's been identified in one of its phases as a place where people were doing, were doing, um, were as a brothel. And one of the reasons it's been identified like that, this is Building Z, is partly because of all these little rooms in it. Um, and in this earlier phase, I think this is just a private house. Um, but it's these kinds of funny assemblages <coughs> with, with these little caches of loom weights. But again, there's quite a few of them. But there aren't that many. There's never more than about 20 in a cache. So, and there is a lot of, there is just a huge amount of artifactual material. So whatever is going on in this house, I mean, maybe these women are genuinely textile workers. It's possible it's a brothel. The evidence is just really not strong enough to say what's going on. But it is quite weird. And there are a lot of these small caches. But then you also get a lot of those small caches in Olynthus as well. And I think they're just ones that get left behind for whatever reason. So whether this is a brothel or not with weaving prostitutes, who knows? There isn't a huge amount of evidence, and I think it's, it's at the moment really up in the air and not very conclusive. I just don't know quite what to think of that. Um, but if women and their families are weaving all these textiles, how do they go about, about as it were, getting rid of it or selling these things. And I think they do indeed do that. Um, I think wealthier families are in a better position to mobilize groups of women. And it seems very unlikely to me that most women were selling the products of their labor directly in the market or even from home. Possibly men did this, but I think in most houses that's unlikely because my guess is that if your family was weaving lots of textiles and you were quietly getting rid of them on the market, you don't want your neighbors knowing this, so you're not selling them necessarily out the shop and attached to the front. What I would suggest instead, and this is where it seems to me that Xenophon passage near the be beginning in the first page of the handout that I talked about seems to me very interesting, is that um, it seems to me that men like Aristarchos in that Xenophon passage are the men who are perfectly positioned if they have some kind of workshop or whatever it is that they have also to be acting as retailers and agents and middlemen or even middle women where they would discreetly go around houses, buy up surpluses and then be selling them out their shop rather than, rather than actually individual households doing it themselves. And I think, I think the activities of an Aristarchos here are potentially, and again, it kind of makes sense of some of the ac occupational names for things like clothing and textile retailers that we get, that many of these people are not only retailers, that they're probably also middlemen or middlewomen who are buying stuff off the surplus that particular houses are producing. So that women are producing wealth, but it just isn't necessarily immediately obvious or visible or upfront in the sources. I think it is there if we dig a little bit deeper. So in conclusion, it seems to, um, and I think again, where, where, you, where you actually where you actually see some of this is in the, the range of textiles that people have in their houses. This is just a little example <coughs> from the, the, the um, attic stelae, where, to be honest, they're selling off the junk after, the after people have already got rid of the good stuff. This is, I mean, they're selling off the rags. 
they're auctioning off the rags. Textiles are valuable. And I think a lot of these valuable textiles, you know, and the value of these textiles suggests that, that these women weaving in their, in their courtyards and their back rooms and whatever are actually potentially really bringing in some serious income into these households. And yet it's all under the radar. It's hidden in these w groups of wo working <coughs> women and weaving women that we don't really see up front. So I think in conclusion, textile manufacture is a complicated business. It's interwoven literally with women's work and lives. That skills move with women from family to family along with weaving tools themselves. That with slave and free and freed women work together sharing these skills. And that girls grew up knowing that working wool or linen would would consume a huge chunk of their lives, supply their main source of wealth and potential independence, and serve to underpin their identities and relationships to the, under, un, to the, to the other women in their lives. But that this most important sector of ancient Greek economies was largely the work of women, I think of that we should have no doubt. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lynn, for a very inspiring talk, sort of bringing together a sort of whole range of issues for you, which you could group under uh, this marriage pattern, social uh, organization, uh, things, people without history coming from the text, but also from the archaeological material. So, question, sis. So, Lynn, uh, I have a question. What about physical evidence, uh, skeletal evidence for say, deformation of, you know, hands or whatever. That's, a really, that's a really, really good question. And of course, one of the difficulties is the lamentable lack of skeletal evidence from, from the Greek world. Um, on the Metapanto skeletons, which are pretty well preserved, there isn't a lot of evidence of it. And I, d I, I don't think you would really see it so much I don't think you would necessarily be able to identify that kind of evidence as explicitly textile related, if that makes sense. So a lot of it would be, a lot of it would be probably, a lot of it would be probably just to kind of general arthritis and things like that, that you might not be able to pick up as being specifically related to textiles, as I understand it. I'm not an osteoarchaeological specialist. The other problem as well is that, of course, for example, in the Metaponto cemeteries, most of the women that we have buried there are relatively elite women. And I'll bet you they weren't doing anything like quite so much of that beating of loom weights or loom warps in the same way that slave women were. And it's, it's I would guess, on the women doing the hardest work where we would see that. Because again, you're right, things like grain grinding, people do pick up <coughs> osteological evidence of this. But I don't think anybody's ever done much with trying to identify the, text the, the textile making. And that's partly because of the lack of skeletal material. Somewhere I read the scallop, scalloping that you see in um, teeth. Yeah, that may, that, that may, from pulling threads and yeah. things. Yeah, that may be related. And where you might also expect to see it is for people who are doing things like spinning lots of wet linen. Mm -hmm. Because when you're spinning linen, it needs to be wet. I mean, when I've spun linen, I always do it with a cu like a cup of water there. But I've also seen people do it going, you know, because that's another way, obviously, of just keep making sure that the thread stays wet. So yeah, with teeth and things, I think you would see that as well depending on, on how people are doing it. But to be honest, I suspect nobody's really looked. It's a good question. Peter. Um, it seems to me that <coughs> you've done an excellent job of demonstrating that this is a domestic activity and therefore yeah. a female activity. But like a lot of activities that are domestic in many ways, once they become outside the house and professionalized, like cooking and tailoring and so forth, they become male. Yeah. And it seems to me it's incumbent upon Acton to demonstrate that weaving at some point somehow moved out of the house, yeah. at which point it could very well have been masculine. Yeah. But um, 
I can't imagine. I mean, there doesn't seem to be much evidence for that. No, no, there um, isn't. And again, when you get these like big caches of loom weights that might be a weaving workshop, right. they're so unusual. I mean, Linthus, that Olynthus one is such a good example because it's a one-off. <laughs> That's precisely the point. Or the Torre de Santriano example. Again, it's a one-off. They're not common. So you, you're just not seeing the big workshops if they were there, at least the physical evidence for well, it. Well, also, to review them, you know, there are plenty of examples. And clearly, colonial America is yeah, a good example exactly. where homespun was where the cloth came from. Absolutely. I mean, there was some imported for England and so forth. But, you know, homespun was, you were able to make that and, and mm. provide without having some kind of industrial activity producing it. So exactly. I think there are probably plenty of, and, mm. and even peasant Greece Absolutely. 200 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, everything was produced, everybody, every house had a loom. I mean, yep. when I was doing research 40 years ago, yeah. there were looms in virtually every house. Oh, yeah, I know, and I, I, I remember that, and too. Hamish, that's, that's yeah, the same Hamish's thing work in, is the uh, same, Madden. exactly. We have all they the all same stuff. You know, they all had a loom. They were producing and the women stuff. all still knew how to spin. Yeah, sure. I mean, it was nice Greek ladies that taught me to spin. That's right. And in connection with that also a mixture of things. So certain fabric you make at home, all this you buy outside. That's so right. For example, linen and so was more made at home, whereas wool became industrialized earlier. Yeah, exactly. Depending on where you were, that's right. And also I suspect what you probably got were <coughs> particular women, as as one sees in, in even the modern Greek world, you'll have met this Peter, where you'll get a household where there's a few women who are extra yes. specially skilled. And they'll make the really beautiful stuff with like the silver and gold thread and the extra beautiful kind of bands and things like that. Now, I think those are the kind of women where they may be making surplus stuff that's in demand, and that's what's being sold out the back door and ending up on the market. And a lot of this stuff clearly does end up in the retail area. It's being sold in the market. Textiles are one of those things that are a kind of Coles to Newcastle export. Somebody else's exciting textiles are always worth buying, you know, even if you make them yourself. And so you get, you do get these things being a part of conspicuous consumption, and luxury textiles are really important, but they are being manufactured for the most part in domestic settings. And I think the, the, the point that you're making, where you really see the differences with the Roman world, where it does go outside the home, it is more professionalized, and then you do see men, mostly low status men, also becoming involved in it. And that is completely different from what we're seeing in the Greek world. It really is not visible for the most part. John? <laughs> so at one moment in passing, then the made a reference to households wealthy enough to own a loom. Yes. And I wonder what you mean by that. I mean, what do I know about weaving? It's women's work. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, really isn't all you need some lumber, right, to make the frame and so on. But, but then, you need lumber that's Then you got all the, the loom weights, right? But as you've shown, these... These can be pretty These could homemade. be... Hand, you know, homemade yeah, or passed down homemade. from you know one generation to the yeah. next. So, but easily you also you also but. need fleeces and access to fleeces. You also, if you want colors, you need to to have somebody dye it or to dye it yourself. And I think in the Greek world you get both. I didn't even talk about dyeing. That's another whole can of worms, because you do get professional dyeing. Um, but p particularly for, for special colors like the purple. There's other kinds of dyeing that I think is going on at a domestic level, which is different kinds of more mundane colors. You also get things like metallic thread and luxury things. So I think, I think if you have a whole group of weaving women, that also entails something like a supply of fleeces. So one of the things I've wondered about is the extent to which is there a market in fleeces, and fleece varies in quality, not only from type of sheep to type of sheep, but also on the sheep. There are some bits that are nicer than other bits. So ideally, you want nice wool from their little tummies. That's the bit that's really good, fine wool. The bits from their back is a bit scruffier. But people are going to be weaving like those big clunky loom weights. I think you're going to be weaving things like goat hair and, you know, 
rugs and blankets and sort of, again, in the, in the attic stele, one of the things that you get is references to things that sound like flaccati, the big fluffy blankets. And, and that the, the meaning of the term sounds like something that is a <laughs> flaccati. So that may be a tradition that goes back quite a long way, which would be really interesting. So I think there's a lot of differentiation, and I think that's one of the things that's so difficult about this, that a loom that's weaving basic, the equivalent of American colonial homespun is one thing, but with some of these wealthier households, they're doing stuff that's much, much more elaborate and fancy than that. And it also suggests that you not only have a really nice loom that isn't all bent and gross and falling apart, but that also you're able to get those raw materials. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so so it's running a loom not in the sense of just the physical loom, but of all the stuff you need to go with exactly. it. Exactly. So you don't really mean wealthy enough to own a loom, but wealthy enough to, to own a operate, operate, a operate weaving, a weaving work. In of, of, yeah, exactly. And I think, again, there's probably a lot of nuancing that we're missing in the source material. So that if you think about it, people could be doing this at many different levels. So that running a loom, which does just does the most basic clothing, is one thing, and most basic pieces of cloth. And then there are other households, which will clearly be have skilled slaves, for <coughs> example, or skilled women in the house who can do much, much more elegant and, and fancy stuff. So I think it's really complicated. <laughs> and we are just missing all of that nuance. Yes, I, I one want more to ask, yeah, one, one question about the loom. You are, you are showing us the loom that we saw the for Homeric times and very yeah. classical, this big vertical loom. But do we have also attested more smaller horizontal yeah. looms? Yes and, yeah, yes and no. The horizontal loom really comes in, the horizontal loom that you see in modern Greece really comes in <coughs> the Romans. And even in the Roman world, you get a mix so that like Pompeii is actually full of loom weights. Most of which, interestingly enough, show up not in, in show up particularly in, in, um, in the courtyard bit, in the, in the atrium, which is really interesting. So maybe this is where women were weaving. We don't really know for sure. But, but loom weights tend to gradually disappear in the Roman world, largely because people seem to be using more in the way of horizontal looms. Now, you also get showing up on Greek vases sometimes little hand looms, which are, are quite small things. And some of those look like they're being used for a technique that's called sprang making kind of little hair nets and stuff like that. And if you look on Greek vases, you often see women wearing these hair net things. So I think there's a whole series of, like with the tablet weaving and so forth, there's a whole series of other techniques of working wool in addition to the warp-weighted loom that people are doing. Again, the whole thing is much more complicated than we usually think. I think, you know, okay, one, so one I, final question there. It's very there, short. Okay. Uh, I know that in the early medieval world, uh, the, the church, the, the state actually, owned slaves in which, uh, who were employed in sort of papal estates specifically to make, specifically to make investments and things, yeah. So how do we, do we have any idea of how sort of publicly owned textiles would have been acquired, like textiles used in state-sponsored events? or Well, it depends. There, there's a whole range of different ways it happens. So a lot of it, in, a, in, in classical Athens and in other classical cities, archaic and classical cities, women volunteer their services to weave, weave and produce um, ritual garments, which then becomes kind of an honor and a sure. thing that you do. And that's cool. And you also get that in the medieval world, where very elite ladies spend lots of time yeah. making religious vestments as private women. So that happens there too. But you also get you also get occasional sanctuaries where it looks like there is weaving going on. So um, Mark Kleivek, for example, at at Madison, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. as it happens, has done some very interesting stuff on some of the Hellenistic Asia Minor sanctuaries, which appear to have textile industries in them. And the sanctuary at Paestum in, in southern Italy, just south of Naples, there may be weaving going on there. So it's quite variable. 
But again, the early medieval world is really interesting because what women value and pass around in that world, at least in Anglo-Saxon England, isn't the loom weights, which are horrible. Anglo-Saxons have really gross loom weights, but they have beautiful spindle whorls. And so the spindle whorl is then what you hand down to your daughter or pass on to your sister or whatever. So it, this shows up in other cultures too. Thank you very much. I think that's a great note yeah. uh, to thank uh, Lynn once more and to move next door where uh, yeah. there's another complex operation that here at the Institute we've uh, got mastered quite well, which is serving a glass of wine or other refreshments yes. after these yes. talks. So, but first, uh, let's thank Lynn. Thank you.